John Hancock, one of America's founding fathers, left his unforgettable signature on the Declaration of Independence, but his mansion, once the largest in Boston, was completely forgotten. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. In 1737, John Hancock was born into colonial Massachusetts. After graduating from Harvard, he went to work for his uncle, one of the wealthiest merchants in the New World. Shortly after, he inherited the company, making him one of the richest men of the time. All the while, he had become greatly involved in politics, bankrolling a significant portion of the colony's fight for freedom from Great Britain, and earning him the title of Founding Father. When he signed the Declaration of Independence, he did so in such a grandiose way that his mark would forever be ingrained in American culture. To this day, it is still common to hear the phrase Hancock in place of signature when being asked to sign something. After his uncle passed, he moved into his mansion known as Hancock Manor. In a time when most people lived in a humble two to three room house, the stone structure stood tall above the Commonwealth as the largest house to have ever been built in Boston at the time. The interior was said to be sumptuous and styled with refined dignity including a great ballroom and a dining room which could seat 30 guests. But there was only one problem. The space it occupied was at the top of Beacon Hill, the most prized piece of real estate in all of early American Boston. As the city grew and flourished, the state house was built next door and the Hancocks slowly sold off their excess property until the once massive estate was confined to a small yard surrounding the main house. Even the small patch of yard became too valuable to leave for only grass to grow. Finally, nearly nine decades after John Hancock's passing, the family sold the lot to a developer who intended to build the most expensive duo mansion the city had ever seen. The Hancock house was torn down and quickly replaced by a four-story duplex. By chance, and in keeping with the tradition of the lot, Boston's wealthiest merchant of the 19th century, Gardner Brewer, purchased one half of the duplex. This time, no space was wasted for a yard. The limestone block walls reached all the way to the furthest bounds of the property lines to ensure the twin mansions would be as large as possible. Entering the Brewer's mansion, we arrive in a colonnaded hall separating us from the grand stairs. The house was filled with marble statues and priceless antique Chinese porcelains. From the moment you entered the house and were ushered into the reception room, you would be overwhelmed with a grand display of wealth, with strands of pearls draping the 24 karat chandelier. The library, doubling as an art gallery, was meant to dazzle with bisque statues and lace-covered sofas. Skirting the walls behind Japanese silk screens were glass-paned half-height bookcases. And after rotating about the chandelier, the fireplace comes into full view with a large gilded mirror set below a hand-stenciled ceiling. Next, we will travel into the parlor, where painted wood panels rise nearly 14 feet below a decorative plaster ceiling, faux to appear as marble. Traveling further into the house, beyond velvet curtains, we uncover the dining room with a festooned cove cornice trimming an elaborately coffered ceiling. We can imagine this house without electricity, glowing from the hundreds of candles in each room kept lit by an army of servants. There were dozens more rooms in this house, each a testament to the masterfully skilled artist who decorated the home. Even the bedrooms were filled with artwork and antiques, in a time when no guest would have ever stepped foot in them. Each bedroom came with its own dressing room, where the brewers would be dressed by their staff. And some even had their own sitting rooms, where each member of the family could retreat for some peace and quiet. But this also was too grand to last. History was repeating itself. The land the duo mansion sat on was far too valuable to be used as a residence, as the city and state continued to grow. The state house was running out of room for its functions and had expanded to one side as far as it could. By 1917, the duo mansion now stood in the way of a functioning state government and was acquired by Massachusetts to be demolished. Today, the ground occupied by the west wing of the Massachusetts State House and a portion of the lawn surrounding it rests on the site of some of Boston's most historically and architecturally significant lost mansions. What are your thoughts? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.